Welcome to the chapter The Underpinnings of ML. This chapter will go a little deeper into machine learning by focusing on how algorithms work. We will explore the important algorithms and their internal working in simple words using real life examples without any maths or coding. We will learn concepts like linear regression, decision trees, and neural networks. In earlier chapters, we learned that we feed the data having instances with features along with the expected output to the algorithm which generates the model. Then this generated model can predict the output from the live data or the input for which we do not know the labels. But what's there in the algorithm that generates the model? And what does a model mean? Let's try to answer these questions. Let us take a really simple example of predicting the salary based on the number of years of experience. Say after first year, your salary was 2000 and after the second year, your salary became 4000 and the third year, 6000. What will be your salary in the fourth year? That's right, it is 8000. Let us convert this problem into instances, features and labels and see how to make the computers solve this problem. In our case, there is one feature, years of experience. In real life, there could be multiple features such as the area of expertise, the location, etc. And there is one target or label, salary. We would want to train a model such that the model can predict the salary for the fourth year. Here, the model has predicted the salary for four years of experience as 8,000. Now let us understand what goes into training it. A simple way to solve it is to just plot it on a chart. The horizontal axis being years of experience and the vertical axis being the salary. And once we are done with plotting, we can figure out the salary for the fourth year, which turns out to be 8,000. Here, we were lucky to have perfect data with which we could draw a straight line. What if our data was more like real world data where we don't always get a perfect straight line? Say if the salaries for the three years were 2010, 3980-6020 Can we draw a straight line that passes through all the points? No, we can't. So, what do we do in this case? How do we figure out the salary for the fourth year? The first strategy is to come up with a straight line that is closest to all the points. This approach is known as linear regression. Though there are various ways to do prediction, which we'll talk about later, for now, what could be the definition of the best fitting line? The best fitting line or the line of best fit is a line which is closest to all the points, meaning it has minimum error. So, we could find the average of total deviations and we can calculate the total deviation either by summing up the absolute differences or the squares of differences and find a line which has the minimum error. Let us visualize the error. In this diagram, line 1 has the minimum error and hence it is the best line as compared to line 2 and line 3. So our machine learning algorithm needs to come up with such a line which has the minimum error. Here, each line is basically a model. The model or line that algorithm comes up with will be used for predictions. We could create a simple algorithm that iterates over all possible lines and keeps the best line so far. Such an algorithm will basically try lines with all possible slopes and distances from the center. What do you think is the challenge with this approach? It will take a huge amount of time to come up with the best model even in such a simple case. 
why not try to go to the side where the error is reducing? One such approach is gradient descent. Let's understand this approach. Say we start with a random line with some slope and intercept. And then we try increasing the slope a little bit and observe the change in error due to the change in the slope. Here we have three instances 2010, 3980 and 6020. To compute the change in the error, we will have to check with all the instances. If the error is decreasing, we continue to increase the slope at a faster pace. The question is, how much should we change the slope to get the next line after each probe? In simple words, the increase in the slope should be proportional to the rate of decrease in error. The more the change in error, the more we should change the slope. So we can say that the increase in slope is equal to some constant multiplied by rate of decrease in error. Please note that this decrease in error is with respect to the change in slope. So now we can say that the new slope is equal to old slope plus the change. And the change is learning rate, which is some constant number, multiplied by the rate of decrease in error. If the error is increasing with increasing slope, we decrease the slope as in the diagram. This method is called gradient descent. Gradient means the rate of change and descent means going down. We go to the side where the gradient of error is going down. Since a line is defined by slope and its distance from the center, called intercept, we do same tweaking for the intercept too. Since the gradient descent is the core algorithm in machine learning and deep learning, we would spend some more time on this. Say we are trying to find a line that fits our data points, we start with a random line. Here the line is our model, because using this line, we will be doing the prediction of salaries as we did earlier. We then slightly increase the slope and calculate the change in error. Also notice that to compute the change in error, we will have to consult all the training instances. If the error decreased due to increasing the slope, we continue to increase the slope in a greater amount proportional to the rate of change. Otherwise, if the error has increased, we go in the opposite direction that decreases the slope in the proportion of the rate of change. Larger the change in error per change in the slope, larger the tweaking we do in the slope. If the error did not change due to change in slope, we stop because we have probably found a line that is the best fit. Afterwards, we go back to tweaking the slope again. It is called the next epoch or the next iteration. We continue doing it until we find the error is no longer changing due to tweaking. The model is the line which has two parameters, slope and the intercept. Also note that the way we tweak the slope, we would be tweaking the intercept too. Let us take one more example to understand the gradient descent. Say, you have checked into a new hotel in winter and you have to take bath and you do not know which side you should be rotating the knob to to give cold and hot water. What would you do in order to get the best temperature of the water for yourself? Think for a moment. One approach could be that we start with the knob at extreme left and try all orientations. But that would take too much time as well as it would waste lots of water. Could you think of a better approach? Please take a moment to think. Alright, so this is what we would do if we follow the gradient descent algorithm. We will start somewhere in the middle or any other random position of the knob, check the water if it is of the right temperature. If it is, then there is no point in tweaking further. 
you have found a comfortable temperature and you can take bath if the temperature of the water is not comfortable to you either because it's too cold or too hot you would like to tweak the position of the knob now you slightly rotate the knob to the right and check if the temperature is going towards your comfortable side then rotate in the same direction by a larger amount and afterwards we continue the same process again if in the previous step rotating slightly to the right was taking the temperature of the water to uncomfortable side either too hot or too cold we would twist the knob to the left by a large amount once we have found the comfortable position we can mark the angle and this is what we call our model this particular model has only one weight that is an angle the algorithm that we have used was gradient descent in machine learning we can make the computer use the gradient descent to tweak the model such that the model starts performing well first on the training set and then on the test set also notice that once you have trained the model running it is generally very fast only the training takes time now let us extend the same example to two knobs what if we have two knobs maybe one for cold water and other for hot water but you do not know which one is which now in this case you will have to tweak both the knobs simultaneously in order to get the right flow and comfortable temperature so in this model how many weights do we have two right at the end of training or tweaking we would get the two positions of the knobs in this model we would be able to get two outputs the right water flow and a good temperature but we have more weights to train and hence the training will take more time we can represent the same using this diagram what if we had more parameters such as climate person's details and the input temperature in that case we would require a lot more weights or knobs and the model will be very complex now let's take a look at a different way of solving machine learning problems it is called decision trees even if we are not aware we make hundreds of decisions based on simple conditional statements in our day to day life decision trees are just an extension of this way of making decisions in the example on the screen the decision tree is for deciding if i should accept a new job offer or not first i check if the salary is at least $50000 if it is then i check if the commute is more than 1 hour and then i check if it offers free coffee so based on these three questions i make a decision on whether to accept or reject the new job let's take a simple example to demonstrate the working of a decision tree suppose we have the data on age and salary and we want to predict the salary for a given age Let's see how we can solve this problem using decision trees. First, let's visualize these data points on an age versus salary graph. A quick way to make the first level decision tree would be to split this data into two groups by drawing a vertical line somewhere in the middle of the age axis. Say at age 25. Now we have a simple model that can predict the salary for a given age if we have to predict the salary of the person identify which group he belongs to based on his age if his age is greater than 25 then his salary will most probably be an average of ages of the group on the right side of the line and similarly if the age is less than 25 then his salary would most probably be an average of the salaries of the group on the left of the line let's take one more example we will use the iris dataset here 
which contains 150 rows or instances and four columns of features. Each of these observations is labeled as one of the three flowers, Setosa, Versicolor or Virginica. Let us see how can we use decision trees to identify a new instance of a flower. To make it simple, we will use only two features, petal length and petal width. Using the first feature, the petal length, the algorithm has separated the flowers into two groups, one that has petal length lesser than 2.45 cm and the other that has greater than 2.45 cm. What the algorithm has done is that based on the petal lengths of all the flowers in the 150 observations, it used the number 2.45 as the boundary condition for grouping one class of flowers. We will see later how we can come up with these limits. The flowers that have petal length lesser than 2.45 cm are classified as setosa. The flowers that have petal length greater than or equal to 2.45 cm are either versicolor or virginica. So, we need the next criteria such as petal width being lesser than 1.75 cm. In this case, to separate the remaining two classes of flowers. As per this model, if the petal width is less than 1.75 cm, we know that this flower is most probably versicolor and if it is greater than 1.75 cm, it is virginica. The same process can be visualized in the form of a graph. We start by plotting the graph of petal length versus petal width. Based on petal length, we draw the first boundary condition. Any instance which comes to the left of the boundary is a setosa. And then we draw the next boundary based on the next condition, which is petal width being less than 1.75. The instances that come below the second boundary are versicolor and the ones that come above the second boundary are virginica. Now that we have seen what a boundary condition is, let's understand how the algorithm actually comes up with the boundary condition. Let's go back to the initial age versus salary prediction problem. For ease of visualization, plot the points on the graph. In order to find the right boundary value, the algorithm does the following steps. It first picks the feature age and assigns a boundary value to begin with. Now we have two groups of data. Then it checks the purity of the groups. It finds how many of the similar instances are grouped together and how many of the dissimilar instances are grouped wrongly. Here. The similarity is based on the salaries of the people. The group having similar salaries is purer than the one having less similar salaries. If the similarity or purity is best so far, it keeps the boundary and moves on to choosing a new boundary. It selects the boundary from the next age and then checks the purity or similarities of both the groups. And this way it finds the best model that separates the data into two groups such that data in either side is very similar to each other. Once we have found the best boundary, we can go further and divide the data on each side of the boundary in the same fashion. Every time we divide the data, we are basically creating a node in the tree and hence, the depth of the tree keeps on increasing. Also notice that if we do not stop the decision tree from growing, it will keep on dividing the data until it can't divide it further. That is, only one element is left in the group. This leads to overfitting because it would be able to do very precise predictions on known data but would not generalize well on the unknown data. Here in this diagram, we are taking an example of a data set where the outcome 
is non-linear. As the value of x is increasing, the value of y first comes down and then it starts increasing. A straight line cannot be a good fit for such a data set. But a decision tree is able to fit this data and it can do reasonable predictions. In the diagram, the vertical lines represent the boundaries or nodes of the decision tree while the horizontal lines represent the average value of each bucket. So, a decision tree is quite capable to do complex predictions that may not fit a straight line. We have seen that decision trees are very popular because they are easy to visualize, interpret and explain. But if not designed properly, there is a high probability of overfitting or memorization. In the situation where it is mandatory to be able to explain the model to various stakeholders, people prefer to use decision tree, but controlled or regularized ones. We will be briefly covering another way of coming up with a model called the SVM. But before that, let's understand what linear classifiers are. Consider the two classes, Setosa and Versicolor from the Iris dataset. We can visualize the two groups on the graph. If we are to separate these two groups of the data points using one straight line, we can have multiple such straight lines to do so. Simple linear classifiers do exactly this, separating the groups using straight line. Here in this graph, three sample lines are shown, red, violet, and dotted green. While the red and the violet lines do a moderately good job, the green or dashed line clearly does not do a good job at separating the two classes of data. Now, let's focus on the two lines, red and violet, which seem to do a good job. These lines are the linear models to classify the data. Do you think these lines are the best one to separate the data? What about the instance A? The violet line will classify A as Setosa, even though it is very close to the Versi color. And what about B? The red line will classify the instance B as Versi color, even though it was supposed to be Setosa. So, neither of these lines are generalizing very well. How about the dotted black line? Will it be better than the wallet and the red line? Will it be able to classify instance A and instance B really well? Yes, of course. So, just coming up with the lines that are able to separate the existing instances is not good enough. We need to come up with a line or a model that separates the classes with the maximum margin. This is what our next topic SVM is about. Let's compare this to another classifier called SVM or Support Vector Machine. Instead of just trying to separate the two groups like a, like a simple linear classifier, SVM tries to maximize the boundaries between the groups. You can imagine the algorithm trying to fit the widest possible street between the two groups such that the two sides of the streets touch one of the boundary instances in each of the group, this is also called the large margin classification. Adding new training instances which are away from the boundary condition does not affect the model since the model only depends on the instances which are on the edge of the boundary. These boundary instances are called support vectors. Hence the name support vector machines. The model in this case is the central line of the street. Using this middle line, we make the predictions. Why is linear SVM better than simple linear classifiers? The instances in the simple linear classifier come so close to the boundary lines that there may be a chance that a new instance 
might fall in either side of the classifier and so might not perform very well on unseen data. In SVM, on the other hand, because the decision boundaries are as far as possible between the two groups, there is a lesser chance that a new instance will fall into a wrong group, therefore ensuring better performance on new instances. Now that we established if we can come up with a maximum margin street between the instances, we would get a better model. The question is how to come up with such a street? There are two ways. One is mathematical and other is using gradient descent. The gradient descent way should be clear to you. All it will be doing is coming up with a random street Tweak it a little and see the impact. If the impact is positive, keep going. Otherwise, go in the opposite direction. The mathematical way is really fast and used if you have few instances. We would not be going into the mathematical way here. Just like decision trees and linear models, the SVM can be used for regression along with classification. In classification, the street should be widest such that it separates the instances well and in regression, the street should be narrowest such that it includes the instances well. If we go back to our original problem of finding salary in the fourth year, how will the SVM solve it? We will first come up with the support vectors that give the narrowest street such that all the data points are well within the street. There are multiple such streets possible, but one shown here seems to be optimum. Once we have come up with the street, we can draw the central line, which can be used for prediction. This is your salary in fourth year. To sum up, SVMs are very versatile since they can be used for classification, regression and outlier detection. Since SVMs focus on fixing the boundaries using a minimum number of data points, they are ideal candidates as models when we are dealing with small and medium data sets. Now let's try to understand neural networks. The algorithms fashioned based on the working of an animal brain. In the recent past, the artificial neural networks are doing an incredible job in predicting. This is a simple representation of how neurons are connected to each other. Notice that all inputs are connected to all the neurons and each neuron is also connected to other neurons. Here, the input layer is represented in red and the output layer is represented in blue. A simple neural network has only one layer of neurons between the input and the output, otherwise known as the hidden layer. And a deep neural network has many hidden layers. Let's go back to the earlier example of knobs controlling the temperature of the water. But here, instead of just two knobs, we have five knobs linked to the five input features as shown. We need to turn the five knobs in any direction to give us the right flow and temperature of the water. What will be the right positions of the knobs to get the right temperature? If we rotate individual knobs, we can come to a combination of knob positions that can give us the right temperature. We can further improve the result if we add another layer of knobs such that the output of the first layer of knobs goes as the input to the second layer. We have another set of five knobs to fine tune the output of the first layer of knobs. Predictions could be improved further if we add a third layer of knobs. This can be a generalized analogy to a deep neural network with three hidden layers. We have seen that Training a single neuron can be easily done using gradient descent. But how can we train a network that has two knobs or two neurons? Imagine the same scenario 
in the context of neural networks and think of these two knobs as neurons. Let's see a simplified version of neural network. We have the same two inputs, hot and cold, and our objective is to get the right temperature. Let me introduce a new concept here called back propagation or backward propagation of errors. To be clear, the knob on the left we are going to call it as first and the one on the right we are going to call it second. Let's start. The first step in the process is called initialization where we assign random positions to both the knobs. Based on the position of the knobs, we calculate the temperature of water that is coming out from the first knob, the interim temperature, and also find out the temperature of water that is coming out. And then, note the difference in the temperature with respect to the ideal temperature. This is called the forward pass. Now, we start the back pass. In this step, we freeze the first knob and tweak the second knob a bit and observe the impact on the output. Did the temperature go to the right side or wrong side on rotating the knob slightly? If it was going in the right direction, we rotate the knob further, else we rotate the knob in opposite direction. This is basically gradient descent. In this step, we rotate the second knob once. We now freeze the position of the second knob and tweak the first knob. Essentially, what we are doing here is adjusting the first knob by learning from the difference in temperature. This is called back propagation. We now have a revised position for the first knob as well and we are closer to the ideal temperature. We now go to the next iteration or the next instance and the process repeats starting from the forward pass step. Let's get a real perspective of artificial neuron. It is basically a software construct. Let's get into the structure of neuron in the context of artificial neural networks. We have already seen that we get an output from the neuron based on the input provided to the neuron. Apart from the input and the output, the two other components that you need to know are the weight, and the bias. Imagine the weight and the bias to be two knobs that need to be tweaked. With respect to a neuron in a neural network, input is multiplied by the weight and the bias is added to get the output. Now, a common question people ask is why do we need bias? Isn't weight sufficient to do the prediction? Can't we achieve all results by just having the weight without the bias. Let me take the same salary example with a little different data points. Imagine that you started your career with a salary of 1000, meaning at the experience of zero years, your salary was 1000. And then after one year of experience, your salary was 1500. And after two years of experience, your salary became 2000. The question is, can we fit a straight line into this data that is going through the center. We have two parameters to define a line. One is how slanting is the line, that is the slope, and where it cuts the y-axis when x is zero. So by varying two things, slope and the intercept, we can achieve the best fitting line. Similarly, in neuron, we have weights, and the bias. Bias signifies that even when the input is zero, there could be some value. Now, let's extend this to a network with two inputs. We take into account both the inputs, their corresponding weights and the bias. The output is a function of these weights and bias. As represented, by the equation zone. In other words, you can say that the output is a weighted sum of inputs plus bias. The researchers further discovered that if we pass this output through a transformation called activation function, the final results are far better. 
Let me explain what it means by an activation function. The role of the activation function is to accept or reject the computed value from weights and bias. It is based on whether the value coming out of the neuron is either too low or too high. We can simply represent the neuron having the activation function inside it. An activation function is a mathematical function to convert huge value into something smaller and also very small values into something closer to zero. So idea is to convert the result into zero or one. Just like converting an analog signal to a digital signal. To further visualize the activation function, imagine a function within the neuron which works like a switch which turns a circuit on and off based on the magnitude of the value that is coming out of the neuron. Thus, the activation function makes the neuron behave like a switch or logic gate. If we combine a bunch of such neurons and connect to each other just like that of a series of circuits on an electronic circuit board, we can get a very complex network of neuron that can do amazing predictions. So, training a neural network is more like automatically coming up with a circuit using the data that could give desired results. But how would we train such network using historical data? This is done using backpropagation algorithm. Let's understand backpropagation algorithm again with an example. Let's take a data set with work experience and salary of four different employees. We will try to train a neural network with this training data. Here, our input features are work experience and the label is salary. Here, we are taking a simple example of two neurons. We call the left one as the first and the right one as the second. In this case, we have two weights and two biases, meaning we need to tweak these four knobs. We want to come up with the positions of various knobs such that this neural network starts predicting salaries based on work experience. Also, to make the calculation simpler, we are not using activation functions in neurons. We go through the initialization phase where we assign random values to the weights and the biases. In this case, we have assigned 1.0 and 0.1 respectively to the weights of the connections of first and second neuron. 50 and 30 are the biases assigned respectively. We take the first record, feed the input from the dataset to the network. Based on the data that we have for this record, the expected output is 100. We do the forward pass and calculate the value of the intermediate stage. That is value after the first neuron. This value is 54 in this case, 4 multiplied by 1 and added with 50. The output from first neuron goes as the input for the second neuron and based on the weight and the bias, the final value is calculated. Here, we multiply 54 with 0 0.1 and add it with 30. We now calculate the error based on the computed value and the actual value. Remember, this is called the forward pass stage. Now freezing the first set of knobs, that is the weight and the bias on the first neuron, we tweak the values of the weight and the bias in the second neuron. Next, we go one step backwards and tweak the value of the weight and the bias of the first neuron by keeping the weight and the bias of the second neuron frozen. This you may recall is called back pass. We repeat the same process all over again by feeding the second record to the network. Please note that we do not reinitialize the weights before picking up the next instance because we do not want to lose the learning from the previous instance. And then we do the same for the third record and then for fourth. At every stage, the weights and the biases of neurons are fine-tuned 
based on the difference in the actual and computed errors. When all the records in the dataset have gone through the process, we say that it has completed an epoch. We now start again from the first record. This is called second epoch. Note that we do not reinitialize the weights and bias when we start a new epoch. The weights and the bias from the previous epochs get carried forward to the subsequent epochs. We continue this process as long as the overall error is going down. Once the epochs are completed, we say that we have trained the neural network with our data. We are now ready to predict the salary of a new employee whose number of years of experience is known. Let's extend the use of neural network onto the MNIST dataset. Assume we have an instance of an image of digit 8. The task of the network is to identify the image as one of the 10 digits, 0 to 9, and assign it to the corresponding label. We have 784 pixels in this image. Each pixel is an input to the network and we have 10 outputs labeled 0 to 9. In such cases where we are doing classification, we want the neural network to give out the possibilities. Here, you can see that the network has predicted the highest probability that is 0.6 and therefore assigned it to the label 8. Let's understand how this training was done, keeping in mind the same process of forward and backward pass that we saw earlier. Just like the earlier example with two neurons, we initialize the weights and the biases of all the neurons in all layers. As a first step, we take the first instance and then feed the inputs, the pixel values, to the 784 input neurons. The expected output, that is the actual probability of the drawing of digit 8 is 1, while that of other digits is 0. We calculate the intermediate values or probabilities at the second layer based on the weights assigned to the neurons and the biases. And then we calculate the result in the final layer. After the forward pass, we get the computed value for each label and find the error between the computed and the actual probabilities. We now tweak the weights of last layer by freezing the values of weights and biases of the other layers using gradient descent technique. Now we move to the previous layer, in this case the first layer. We tweak the weights and the biases of the first layer, keeping the second layer frozen using gradient descent. Once we are done tweaking the weights and biases of both the layers, we move on to the next instance. In this case, we have shown that we picked 0. Now the pixel values of 0 will be fed to the neural network and the weights will be tweaked further such that the actual values match the predicted values. After the first round of training with all the instances from data, we start the next iteration round from the beginning without resetting the weights and biases. The iteration is also called an epoch. We keep the iteration going as long as the overall error keeps coming down. If the error is no longer going down, we stop iteration. This is how we train a neural network to recognize the images. A similar strategy can be applied to recognize faces and to identify the speech and more. We may not be able to visualize how exactly the neural network is doing the magic or how the weights values impact the outcome. Though we can think of neural network as a whole like an electronic circuit, which is auto-created in order to achieve the desired outcome. The weights, the biases along with the number of layers, number of neurons that are present in each layer, 
and how neurons are connected defines the architecture of the network. We will see complex architectures in the upcoming session. In this session, we covered how linear regression, decision trees, SVM and neural networks actually work. We can combine and improvise on these approaches to get even better results, which we will be discussing in the next chapter. I hope you like the session. Thank you.